My name is Anthony Fatsies and welcome to the What The Finance podcast, where we interview finance, trading and investing experts to help you understand current market trends and learn about the intricacies of new and existing assets. If you enjoy the podcast and to help with the YouTube algorithm, please like, comment and subscribe. It really helps with the podcast and it means we can continue to get amazing guests. Thanks again. I hope you enjoy. Jared, thank you so much for joining the What The Finance podcast today to talk about your recently released book, uh, Iceland Secret, The Untold Story of the World's Biggest Con. So on to my first question. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it's not very common for someone from the US to move to Iceland. Uh, can you talk about your journey and how you ended up settling in the country? Sure thing. Well, first of all, just thanks, Anthony, for having me on. And um, yeah, I it was kind of it's a bizarre. Uh, <laughs> I, I stopped over in Iceland in 2002 uh, on my way back from, I had a trip to Sweden. I lived in Boston at the time. And Iceland Air, I don't know if they still do this, but they let me um, stay. Uh, I think I stayed two or three nights in Reykjavik um, as part of the same price for the same ticket. And I just loved it. I just loved it. It was just every, it was, it was really, uh, I don't know. When I came back, people asked me how was Sweden. And I was like, I didn't even remember that I went to Sweden. <laughs> um, and so within two and a half years of that, I had moved there. I had found, I had kind of stumbled into a job and that's at the beginning of the book. I stumble into this uh, job with this Pieter, uh, this kind of shaved headed guy who runs a software company. Uh, and and uh, yeah, I, I just said, I have to try this because I was really burned out. I had been on Wall Street for about five years and this was a chance to do something similar, but in a, a much better place, much higher quality of life. So even though the salary was like, I think it was 40% less than I made in the States. Um, there was no comparison. I mean, there's no comparison. And even though it was a hard transition, I mean, they made me learn Icelandic starting like yeah. the first week I was going to those classes. Even though it was a hard transition, it was it was well worth it. And I ended up uh, going swimming every day after work in these amazing pools. And uh, yeah, it was a, no comparison. Yeah, I'm sure it was a complete completely different like a new world as you said compared to boston <laughs> yeah it was a place where uh for example we found a problem in this i guess this is not this story i don't think is in the book we found a problem in the software we found a bug and it had to do with the way that interest on government bonds was calculated and it was a weird bug and it was like one day a year this this piece of code would miscalculate the interest because it was a date. It was something to do with a date calculation. I stumbled into this bug and I was very like, oh, this is a horrible bug, you know, because it would pay five times the interest on that one day that it, that, than it was supposed to. And I called over, I found the person in the code in my company. It was a small company. I figured out who it was. And I called him over and I said, look at this. And he said, oh, wow, you found a good one there. He said, <laughs> And I was thinking, oh man, you know, because it, it was the end of the day. It was like four in the, well, in Iceland, the end of the day. It was like four in the afternoon. And he said, this really shocked me. He said, well, I have to go pick up my kids now. Um, so let's talk about this. He said, what time do you come in tomorrow? Maybe 8.30 we could talk about this. I said, okay. But I thought this was so weird, you know, yeah. because in Wall Street culture, we would have banged our heads against the, computer until midnight to fix that thing and get it into production and test it and everything but when i got home i realized he was wise because the bug was such that it only happened in may it's yeah. like it happened on may 31st and th that we were in i don't know september or october and i thought actually there's no rush to fix it you know and sure enough we came in the next morning we were fresh we fixed that bug and tested it in about 10 minutes and in a half hour it was it was it was fixed and so that was a, a real wake up call for me about a different way to look at and live life. Um, and I really appreciated that. Yeah. From, from reading the book, um, I've never been to Iceland, but it seemed like the people are very, you can almost say nonchalant. Like they were just, would you agree? <laughs> Sometimes too much. So as you saw in yeah. the book, but in general, it's a place where family always comes first and especially children always come first. So if your child is sick, then people would have there was a special code like a sick child day 
<laughs> and I had never heard of that. I was like, wow. Um, and uh, people would have days off of work for sickness. And then, of course, unlike in the U.S., we actually had vacations that we could actually take them. And so people would say, like, what are you doing for your summer vacation? And I was like, uh, I don't know. You know, because it, in my Wall Street job, there was a year where I wasn't even allowed almost to take vacation until November or something. Mm, you know, the whole yeah. year had passed. Um, but in Iceland, people would take like three weeks off in a row. And even I think, and I guess this is, maybe this is also in the UK. Uh, it's common in Europe in finance jobs. You have to take two weeks off in a row once in the year. And that's an anti-fraud measure. Yeah, That's so that you're away from the desk. And if you were in some kind of a scheme, people would catch it maybe in those two weeks. But in the U.S., of course, they have nothing like this. Um, so, yeah, it was it was a superior place, I think, for living, yeah. for, for daily life. Yeah, definitely. But the, sort of from what, when I was reading the book, it looked like there was almost, um, they didn't really respect, or I don't know if this is true, authority and sometimes rules. So it was sort of like just did what they thought was right. Would you say, especially with some of the things that they were doing in terms of you know, breaking the security rules and the, everything that was happening there. Yeah, that, that's a that's like the dark side of this. Well, on the one hand, it's a culture that's very legalistic. A lot of people study the law and become lawyers. But there's also an old tradition of finding a way around the law or yeah. applying the law in a way that, yeah, you know what I mean? Uh, f finding the loophole. F finding a way to say oh we don't need to yeah and so i think those banks grew to be so huge these were like enron sized institutions as you saw in the book but they were being run as though they were still very small local banks in a small country yeah and was there like a, t a time in when you were living there that you got a bit concerned about you know, how big they were and the prosperity that was happening and that this is, you know, not sustainable. Oh, I mean, uh, unfortunately, some of the, the, the first part of the book was a little longer, the run up to the crisis. And some of that, the publisher said, look, you're a first time author. <laughs> you only get 300 <laughs> pages. Sorry. And they took some of that out. But but ah. um, but yeah, I think there, there's a bit of that in there. Um, yes, I was always worried because I had just lived through the dot com a crash in the US. And I was reading at the time all the Enron books. I was like an Enron junkie. I loved the Enron story. I read, I don't know, I think I read all of the books at that time. There was like three or four books. Um, and so I was looking around and saying like, hey, this is kind of, this feels kind of like that, you know? Um, so I was always worried and I was especially worried when I saw how much real estate inventory new apartments were being built. And I was like, but who's going to live in those apartments? Um, yeah, so there were a lot of signs. And also the private jets going over. Uh, and the fact that people were buying cars that average Americans would not buy. Like, average Americans would not be buying a brand new high-end Jeep, for example. I mean, wealthy, wealthier, upper middle class, maybe. But in Iceland, it was like everybody, it seemed mm -hmm. like. Um and that was kind of, I couldn't figure out how, how the money was, was where, where was the money behind that? And as we know, it was all debt, uh, completely yeah. debt fueled. Yeah, well, it's crazy. Like I was looking at some of the numbers and I know you mentioned some of them in the book, like it, it's almost incomprehensible uh, how bad it was. So I think I was looking at the, you know, the, the three largest banks, their assets were 11 times the country's GDP in yes. 2008. And there were so many other crazy numbers, you know, it's, as I said, it's incomprehensible. So how did it get this bad without ringing any alarm bells whatsoever from government, from regulators, from the banks? <laughs> That's what I think is one of the key messages I, I wrote the book to convey is that it can get this bad and it probably is this bad now uh, in another country that we're not talking about. Mm. Uh, I don't know which country, but yeah. but it's it's easily possible that large scale financial fraud can go on for years unchecked, especially when you have rising markets, then nobody wants to, uh, nobody wants to be the one to spoil the party. Uh, and so the president of Iceland at the time was flying off to Davos in Switzerland and, and pumping the banks and pumping the Icelandic miracle. 
and like everybody was on the same page and then the the media is uh the two major newspapers owned one by a political party and one are controlled by that party and that party is very pro-growth um and the other the other was controlled by one of the owners of one of the banks so there wasn't much of an outlet for anybody there were some pieces as i remember people skeptical about the growth but there wasn't much there uh nowhere near enough and even when even i think this this was in the book and i i think this was even 2008 right before things collapsed um someone respected abroad i think it was a bank analyst made a comment about the weakness of the banks and the minister of of culture and education said they just need some they just need to go take some classes <laughs> you know they were so dismissive of uh, any of the warning signs and i think that's the scariest or one of the scariest aspects of the story because as you know from the book when the crash came it was not just an academic matter for us it was really a frightening frightening several months um, and I think not, some of the research I've been doing, even re recently I did a series of tweets because this was 13 years after those days uh, of the crash. And so I did a series of tweets. And when I was researching that, I realized that those days around the crisis were even worse than I knew. We mm -hmm. were close to uh, even running out of printed money. <laughs> they didn't have enough physical currency almost um, to meet the demand because there was a run on the banks. We were very close to maybe a breakdown in the society, uh, potentially. Yeah. And the, the head of the central bank, who ironically was the one who privatized the banks, <laughs> he was then the head of the central bank. He had a quote a couple of days before the collapse. He said, if we don't get an emergency law so that these banks can, can wind down, we're looking at 30 years of anarchy. And he he was maybe uh, he was maybe right, um, and then on an individual level, you know, we imagine imagine you have only w what money you have in your wallet now, and you can't access the bank account that you have mm -hmm. to get more out, or you go and the the cash machine says it's down for maintenance, you know, yeah. uh, and then you say, well, maybe I'll try to get some foreign currency, just to have it, and then there there isn't any. Um, and then your mortgage payment is going up, you know, every month by 10% or so. Um, and so on. It was just, and, and then the supermarket shelves are going bare. It, it, it was like that. And, oh, and then another country, the UK, uh, puts you as a terrorist or puts your whole country as a terrorist organization so that no money is coming in. No, all payments are frozen. Uh, and so that was kind of how it was in those days. And it was, it was very scary to live through that. And, yeah. you know, it was, it was never fixed. It's not like then <laughs> magically the currency came back in value. Um, all the damage to the economy was lasting. Mm. Uh, and so in my case, we lost our, our house. Uh, we lost our life savings, more or less. I mean, we lost 90, about 90% of that. And you so know what? I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, that's the thing. If you're 35 and you've been pretty diligent about saving and then all that's gone that's very hard to recover from you've mm -hmm. lost now the first decade decade and a half of your of your saving and your uh you know your economic life it's 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 very painful go ahead yeah and, I was, and so many people would be in that position i think you know you mentioned that the stock market went down 95 percent the currency almost halved in value so you know all these basically all the all the um yeah, you know, everything that everyone had gotten used to, like the, the the big cars, the big houses, the private jets, even just you know, you mentioned going to the US and <laughs> loading up on all these <laughs> all these like presents and uh, you know iPods and everything, and then going back, it was just taken away in, in an instant. So everyone almost had to you know, it was from prosperity to the exact opposite in a few days. And it was even scarier in the moment because yeah, what I just remembered it would have been 13 years ago today or yesterday was that the euro you could buy 85 isk to one euro during during the boom years so that was the that was the about the rate that we got used to 85 90 80 something like that uh after the banks were collapsing the euro 
was just going like this and it it, it was it went to 340 from wow. 85 to 340 and then they just stopped all trade in euros and you couldn't even get euros but now and then they then they had with the IMF's assistance they were able to have an in in country exchange rate for the euro which was maybe 160 or something like this is still it was still in half but it could have been it could have gone to a thousand you know it, it was on track to just completely inf inflate away all the value uh, of the currency so that so when you're in that that's really scary because in those on the day that it hit 340 that's just panic yeah um and you don't know that there's going to be a nice system ahead it could just be that it goes to 2000 the next day it's just really really scary yeah well i think we've seen in the uk recently where there was a run on the petrol stations where <laughs> everyone freaked out and it just shows you like it you know it can happen in a day or two and people just freak out and then you know you can imagine that happening to a bank i was just I, that's what i was thinking of wow if it happened to a bank they'd be screwed <laughs> yeah well you know it happened in in the uk in northern rock there mm. was a run on that bank um but as I think I said in the book, uh, relative to the size of the economy, you would have needed 140 Northern Rock collapses in the UK to equal what happened to us, or 300 Lehman Brothers collapses in the US to equate to the size of that. Because those banks were huge on their own. They were huge by world standards. Mm. Um, and, and with a tiny population behind them, it's, it's not sustainable. Yeah, and it seemed like when you look at everything that, you know, the strong corona was through, you know, high interest rates that ISIN was uh, providing and then it was all basically built on loans. So as you said, it was all, uh, you know, basically created out of nothing. There's just prosperity and then it all collapsed in an instant, for sure. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. sustainable. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, as you said, your experience is actually working at the ISIN's regulators. So I'm sure that was <laughs> fascinating and extremely interesting. <laughs> Uh, yeah. can you, <laughs> in good ways and bad, uh, can you talk about the experience and sort of how the process differed potentially from other countries? Uh, I guess that's the only regulator I've ever worked inside of, although I worked here subsequently inside the stock exchange, the Swiss stock exchange as a regulator. Um, I found it to be a, a very nice and friendly workplace. Uh, people were extremely welcoming and they put up with my, you know, broken Icelandic and, uh, you know, <laughs> switching to English sometimes if I didn't have all the words. Um, but I, f I found it supremely uh, ill-equipped to, to regulate a financial system of three, three banks, each the size of Enron, mm. you know, th or as you said, three banks, 11 times the size of the country's GDP. They should have had uh, a staff of a few hundred, probably. So to give you an example, the team that regulates the credit markets, so the, the credit activities of the banks, which is the big thing of the banks, I believe that team was five or six people. And those banks were, you know, the bank's balance sheets together was almost $200 billion. Um, and they had activities and branches um, they had subsidiaries all over the world by this point. They had grown so fast. Mm. Uh, and there was really nobody on top of that. And even when these guys tried to, and I think this is the problem with regulators everywhere. There's another reason I wrote the book. The book is like about Iceland, but it's not really about Iceland. <laughs> uh, when these regulators would come to a meeting with the bank where they wanted to ask some questions, they would be faced across, you know, be two or three guys from the regulator, uh, men and women. And then across the table, you'd have maybe 12 of Reykjavik's best lawyers or, yeah. <laughs> you know, and bank <laughs> employees. And, and, um, you can't compete with that kind of firepower. And so even something, as you saw in the book, uh, I don't know if this struck you, but when I got the emails, I, I want to read some emails from inside the bank. Yeah. That's a, it's a huge problem to get them. When I finally get them, we have one IT guy at the regulator. And he's not hes not a forensic IT person. I mean, yeah. I didn't even know such a thing existed in those days. This was 2009. Um, he was just the IT guy who set up the computers of the regulator. <laughs> you know, he, when you had a Windows upgrade, he came around and said, okay, I just need to, you know. Um, and 
when I needed to read these thousands of emails about the biggest market, probably the biggest market manipulation scam in the history, I need to read emails to get to the bottom of it. I asked him how, how, what's our tool for reading this? He's like, tool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's like, I'll just, I'll just set them up inside your outlook. I'll just put these, these bank managers mailboxes, you know, outlook, you could, I don't know if I, I never use outlook now, but uh, you could have several mailboxes in outlook. Mm. So he would just wanted to put, you know, these ma bank managers and lawyers and everybody's in uh, inboxes into my inbox. And I could just flip through them. And then my, it was like, <laughs> then I could just forward their mails around or, you know, it's, yeah. so I told him at least we need a separate machine, you know, for this and we'll put them on outlook on another machine. He said, Oh, okay. We have machines. <laughs> um, but th that was kind of how the regulator that gives you an idea of how it was inside. Yeah. And it seems like the banks have never really dealt with the, they just done what they wanted and then maybe told them after or sometimes even didn't they didn't weren't too fussed about the regulators <laughs> yeah not at all and even post that was the thing that was really galling to me mm. was we had already had the collapse people were really suffering yeah. uh, in terms of trying to buy food trying to pay their rent or their mortgage and then these guys were acting the same as they had pre-crisis which is that we would send them a letter to get some data or some information and they would just ignore the letter. I mean, uh, it was, uh, th that to me was really crazy. Yeah. And do you think that was just like a superiority complex? Like, oh, we don't have to listen to them. We can do what we, we want or. Yeah. 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 And no con no consequences. Um, they, they didn't really think well, and they were right because Ultimately, only the top people got prosecuted, the mm -hmm. very top people. Uh, and there were many other people who had been involved in some of these things that were too far down the or, uh, the, the chain and, and they, they walked away. Um, so the type, and that was the other interesting thing. You have these huge bankruptcies, but almost all the people working inside the banks are the same people as from before the crisis. Because uh, the banks were just given new identities and domestic mm -hmm. ID numbers and they got to keep going and so you have to deal with the, the same person who created or enabled the crime was still the one you needed to get information from uh which was really incredible yeah so they're not going to cooperate well i was comparing it last night and i was looking and i think you know obviously the population of iceland is about three hundred and thirty thousand. so it's mm -hmm. the same as coventry it's mm -hmm. a bit it's a bit less than coventry where i live so you can imagine that there's there's only a certain amount of people who can actually work at these banks there's only a certain That's amount right. of talent they can't right. at the time the country is collapsing so they can't really bring people from abroad so that's right they just got to recycle them don't they yeah and and nobody nobody it's rare that someone gets fired in iceland for doing a bad job because if you fire someone you have to see them at the supermarket it's yeah. like probably in coventry you know you have to see them later at the shops or something and you kind of don't want the embarrassment of it so you just keep them that's quite often how it works there yeah and I, and I guess it was it, it almost seems like it, it just was too deep the fraud was too and that, that's the one word that you use specifically the title fraud um and when you look at what they did i think you know you mentioned how they would loan money to these offshore banks and then they would basically buy the share price they would buy the share so there was no nothing backing those loans it was just the sh shares of the actual banks so it was almost like a ponzi scheme from, 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 from what it was. yeah 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 it was also like a ponzi scheme in that like in a Ponzi scheme, um, the banks had to double their balance sheet almost annually or every 18 months. They had, to get, they had to get more funding in to pay off the mistakes that they had made mm. the year before. Um, and so as long as they could keep doubling, they, they, were, they, they think they could have, you know, <laughs> that, that, that was their business model. Keep yeah. doubling. And then every day, if the share price starts to drop, on the Icelandic exchange, just go buy the shares. Don't tell anybody. Um, and so you keep, you set the price, they set the share price where you want it. Now those three banks made up most of the market cap of the, of the country by the end. So by setting their own share price, they're basically setting the stock market index itself. So mm -hmm. set the price where you want it. And then based on that nice high price and good stock performance, um, go borrow from abroad you know, on the debt markets and, you know, you lever up the banks, uh, leverage, I think, uh, I don't have it off the top of my head. I think it's, it's 10 or 20 to one, something in that. So you can borrow 10 or 20 bucks for every dollar that you 
have on in equity. So they could they thought they could just keep going with this uh, this merry-go-round. Finally, it was Lehman. It was hmm. the collapse of Lehman that stopped their ability to keep getting financing. I mean, they had but they had been in trouble for years. Uh, and I think a narrative today among these uh, among the former bankers in Iceland was that everything was fine in these banks. It was just, you know, if Lehman hadn't collapsed, we would be in good shape, um, which is kind of funny to me. I was just before we spoke, I was speaking to an old colleague. Um, he's someone I did. I worked with in the investigations. He just finished reading the book also, and he wanted to give me some feedback on it. And he said, it's all happening again, Jared. It's all happening again in Iceland. He said, I wouldn't put my money in this stock market. Um, he said, I don't know how they're doing it, but they're getting you know, all the banks, uh, I think, I believe have relisted themselves now. And it's the same banks with different names, yeah. <laughs> you know? And so he said, it's all, and I, oh, I, you know, so, but in Iceland, I, I, I'm learning people are really um, interested in this book, which is good. I, I want the message to get out there too. Yeah, I think it's, sort of, as you said, it's le trying to learn from lessons, hopefully, because one of my questions was, you know, has, has Iceland really changed? But it sounds like it hasn't if this is happening again. I think in the early years, it did change. Um, well, first of all, it changed in the sense that daily life was really pretty harsh for about a year or two. Um, and a lot of people moved away, including me. I eventually moved away. Um, because it was so hard to just have a, a regular job there and um, and make enough to live basically in those years. Um, and so, and then I heard from people that had been on my team that, that the culture changed um, and that people in the early years, 2014, 15, 16, those years, they were very worried about following the law, having things right, not having this happen again. I think another, you know, half a decade later, it's it's maybe back to the back to the races, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah it's forgotten, and they've probably got the same incentives there that they had before. So it's just incentivizing them to exactly. You brought me to one of my favorite, <laughs> my favorite points from the book is is the incentives, mm. and this is not just about Iceland, but I think in almost no country, I I believe that in Singapore. They have a policy or a rule that their regulator must regulators must be paid what they would be paid in the private sector in the banks for for their for their position level. Uh, I don't believe anybody else has such a law. Um, my information might be a little bit out of date, but in general, I think that's just true. Um, and so, there's no in, there's very little incentive for a regular regulatory employee to go after uh, something that he finds at a bank. Because he probably wants to work at that bank and, yeah. and get a 40% pay bump, you know. He probably has dreams of going over there and working for them. And many of them do. It's a revolving door. Um, and so we haven't set up this system in a way to take potential crimes seriously if they come up. And they always come up. Mm -hmm. Because even though 98% of us follow the law, there's always a few percent, you know, who don't. And who want to, and especially when the incentive is like, hey, if I do this insider trade, I could take home 50,000 or I could take home 100,000 or, or, or something like that. And then on the other side, you have someone who gets paid the same salary no matter what for prosecuting or uncovering that trade. It doesn't work. Hmm. Yeah, no, I think a lot of the CEOs uh, from Iceland, uh, they did, they sort of got punishments, but in the end, it didn't really amount to much. Uh, but you mentioned, you know, they transferred most of the money was out of the country and now they're transferred back in. And now they're the ones basically <laughs> trying to build up the country again. They own the hotels, the or most of the real estate. And it, it's crazy to think that they basically stole from, you know, Icelandic people. And now they're benefiting from it. Yeah. And that takes me to another current topic, which is Pandora Papers, mm -hmm. which is that we have this system whereby it's a crazy system that we have <laughs> with uh, with offshore companies because as you probably know, the money never goes offshore. Uh, if something is denominated in an ISK or, or British pounds, something is denominated in British pounds, it's sitting in London. Yeah. It's always sitting in London. Even if I open a, 
I'm in Switzerland. If I open a, I can open a British pounds account with my bank here. Um, but that will settle through, um, ultimately probably the Swiss national bank or an agent bank and the pounds are kept in an account by some British bank. And the same goes with offshore firms. You know, I can, and this is the crazy thing. I can take a piece of paper, which says British Virgin islands. And, and it says that I own the shares in company X in the BVI. I can take that to a London bank and they will open cash and trading accounts for this company which is just a piece of paper in some yeah. other country. It's like I have a nine-year-old niece, you know, I could have her write me a certificate. It would be the same value. It, it means nothing. What, where, it, where it gains meaning is when that London or New York or Reykjavik bank gives you an account for that company and lets you trade and lets you use their payment uh, and cash systems and loans and take loans in that company's name and so on. That's where... Uh, that's where the problem is. The problem is not offshore. The problem is always onshore. And, and in this case, uh, these guys were able to, these guys have offshore companies. So nobody knows whose money it is. And people always call this, this is another thing I think is a misnomer. First of all, calling it offshore. Second of all, talking about tax havens. Yeah, sure, they help, they help you with tax, that's, that's, but that's only one of the advantages. I think the main advantage is secrecy. Because if you're a former Icelandic bank executive and you managed to keep, I don't know, 50 million pounds overseas, um, now you have that in a, in a company. And now that company can get a bank account in Reykjavik and that company can buy real estate. And nobody can really find out who's behind it. Um, this is how Russian oligarchs are able to buy um, apartments in Donald Trump's, uh, you know, Trump Tower, for example. And in that, it isn't even that is crazy because in this case, they use American states like South Dakota, Wyoming, Delaware uh, as their offshore uh, holding, holding, holding places. So I think this is really, uh, and all of these things could be cleaned up in like a year, really, if we just, you know, but it doesn't benefit, uh, it doesn't benefit uh, politicians, especially the what like, uh, what was it? It wasn't Tony Blair. I think he was <laughs> he was nailed in these P Pandora papers. I mean, powerful and wealthy people who have their money in these systems, they don't they don't really there's no incentive for them to change that. But if we demanded it, we could clean this thing up really fast. And the same with market crimes. If we would just do some prosecutions, it would be easy to fix this. Yeah, because so. as you said, hardly anyone's uh, prosecuted in there, are they? And even in Iceland, there was, you know, hundreds and probably potentially thousands of people involved. And it was only probably less than 10 from what I saw, from what I read in the book. And, and even then they were, you know, most of them got away with it, suspended sentences. And... I want to say the total individuals is 29. Okay. There's a nice, there, there's a footnote in the book. It's, it's a spreadsheet that Transparency International put together in like 2017 or so. And they just showed all the cases and, and uh, how many were charged and convicted. I think it's 29 individuals total. Uh, which is which is good it's mm -hmm. quite a lot uh but they were charged a lot of them were charged in multiple cases so i think the number of indictments was like 77 yeah i get 77 individuals but they're really only 29 of you know they're often charged in multiple cases um yeah th there could have been more you know uh, i think there probably could have been 10 times the number like probably we're talking about it's still a small see, it's still a small number of people in a country of 350,000 maybe you could charge 300 mm. um, it's still quite small it's not that everybody was in on this because yeah. they weren't there's a few there's a few criminals and, 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 and enablers and I think yeah but I think it's, still 29 is not bad <laughs> yeah yeah but even 300 is still like what 0.01% of the whole population which is pretty crazy yeah, you know, it doesn't, and that's the point, uh, a point I want to get across. It doesn't take many people mm. to corrupt a society or to corrupt a uh, financial market. Mm. I mean, there's there, there's regions in southern Italy where the mafia, the population of the region would be like 3 million people. And the number of people estimated total in the mafia is like in the hundreds or a couple thousand max. 
but the mafia controls the whole everything all business and everything there it doesn't take that's an extreme example of corruption but i mean that's why we have to have a bright line when we go after corruption we, we can't have any tolerance for it because it doesn't take much to ruin to just ruin a place yeah as we saw so when we go later on the book it seems like they sort of wanted to roll up the investigation that you know right. sort of start stopping the investigation and did you think people just had enough and they wanted to move on or what why do you think that happens i don't think the public had had enough because the the big headlines were still to come uh because for example we sent and just in general even in even in the us the sec i think their average case takes five years i read that somewhere so white collar crime cases especially when there's a lot of data or a lot of individuals involved they take time and we were uh, we were pretty uh, the prosecutor was pretty much on target with the, with a, about three four five years but already after two years uh, my team at at the at the regulator as you said was was pretty much dismantled mm -hmm. uh and that was about two years before the headlines the big indictments came out in the market abuse cases um and i don't know who was behind that honestly it was above my pay grade but clearly the new anointed powers of the regulator did not want any more of this work to happen and that meant that we closed we didn't even for, we didn't even formally close them they they just languished all these open cases we had a spreadsheet of insider uh, potential insider trading cases that had maybe 50 names on it as far as i know that spreadsheet is just still out there and mm. uh, now of course the statute of limitations has passed so those people are are, are okay but um we had so much to do and the most important thing that we had started working on was what lessons can we learn from all the cases we already investigated what new what new procedures or regulations or or laws do we need now so that this never happens again and that was my most important project at the time that the teams were getting wound down so that never got done and even even so formally we never learned from this but even informally by, by taking the teams apart and reassigning the people all the institutional knowledge of how to investigate a case like this they, they made sure that that never uh saw the light of day again yeah so it's back to you know i i think in the book you mentioned how you actually walked into the bank and that was like unheard of in the time you know most of the time they'd send a letter and then it, I, they hope they get a response so that's just it's just gone back to the way it was hasn't it i i fear so but look i haven't lived in iceland in about eight years so um I, I i fear so and based on my conversation with my former colleague this morning it's 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 pretty pretty sad it makes me pretty sad yeah. um yes yeah, so I, I i couldn't believe it when i was doing my research i couldn't believe that it. it's the largest systematic banking crash by any country in history <laughs> so it was that big so I, i'm not sure if that's true or not so why do you think it's something that most people probably haven't heard much about because I know myself, I'm studying finance and investing and I haven't right. heard about it before the book. <laughs> it's because they didn't have the book. No, I, um, <laughs> I, buy well, the book I, then. <laughs> yeah, buy the book. Um, yeah, I have a copy here. There it is. Yeah, that's right. And, and I'm, I am going to say, say this. I don't say this about every person, I, every book that I read or interview about, but yeah, it is definitely a page turn and I, I did really Thanks. enjoy it. It's, it's something interesting as well. It's something that, you know, you, don't really hear much about Iceland and that may be why maybe it's a because it's a small country I, yeah you know no, none of the big English speaking uh, media has they have stringers there so they have people they can call to do a story but they don't have any nobody's on the ground uh, living through it losing their house not able to buy food and stuff like that so uh, I think that's a big piece and then as far as I know, you know, there have been other books about the Icelandic crisis. A lot of them are kind of textbooky. Um, I think nobody has put the arc. Uh, that's why I, I feel okay saying it's an untold story. The story of this massive share manipulation over a decade uh, and how that could lead to a country's complete devastation. I think nobody has connected the dots until the book. So all the information was out there. Mm -hmm. All the court cases, almost all have have gone through. 
there's amazing i mean there's things <laughs> anything in this book that you would dig into the story is much better than what i told that <laughs> just i don't have enough pages to tell yeah. uh uh i mean this the story is it's so juicy and what people come and say in the court cases is uh is kind of unbelievable in some cases i do have a footnote in there about Lundsbanki. um the ceo and uh, the head of prop trading and one of the traders were were all charged with this market abuse um and in this i this i didn't know but one of their defenses was <laughs> that this had been going on before they started in 2003 and the trader said this was going on back to 1998 and everybody knew about this everybody knew that we were buying up our own shares everybody knew but like it wasn't everybody because i worked in that bank <laughs> i didn't know my mother-in-law worked in that bank since the 70s or 80s she had a lot of her savings in those shares she would have liked to know that i think yeah. <laughs> you know like people pe and so definitely the the man on the street was even behind us because we were even insiders to a degree. Uh, so the average Icelander who, who was a fisherman or a farmer and had a pension fund, the pension fund was heavily invested in those shares because they had to be. Yeah. But they, they would have liked to know that too. Um, and so it was unbelievable. This is their defense in court. Like, hey, everybody was doing it and uh, doing it for 10 years. Yeah, but I, I think there was a time as well that you mentioned they actually asked the FME uh, which is the Icelandic uh, regulators, if they yeah. could do it. And they said, yeah, sure, you can, you can do it. Like they asked at one time or something. Yeah, um, that was a related thing. They needed a place to hide the shares off, getting back to offshore companies, because yeah. they're a huge part of the story. They had uh, created, starting as early as the year 2000, they created a company called LB Holdings. I believe that one was in Guernsey. Um, and... Uh, then they created a series of other companies, and I believe those were in the British Virgin Islands, but I could be mistaken. There was so many companies. Yeah. <laughs> but Lundsbanki had five or six companies, and they were every at the end of every quarter, they had bought up so many of their own shares, they needed to hide them somewhere, and they would stuff them in, among other places, in these companies. And those companies owned, I think, 15, 16%, might be more, can't remember exactly but they owned a significant chunk of the bank's equity and they were all financed by the bank but off somehow kept off the balance they should have been consolidated back on the balance sheet but they weren't and there was one employee of the bank who was voting their shares at the annual meetings of the bank <laughs> and anyway they they had come to the regulator in i don't remember which year and they said we want to warehouse our shares offshore so that when our employees in the years in the future exercise stock options we'll have shares for them i mean this doesn't make any sense at all but the regulator said oh of course yeah go sounds good yeah thanks for asking they, yeah exactly thanks for coming and having the meeting yeah that sounds good to us but it, it didn't make any sense at all but uh that was the one of the big hiding places and the regulator uh, blessed it yeah, it's crazy. So we, we've talked about it before, obviously, offshore banking and, and all that. Do you still have concerns about the current state of banking internationally? Do you have any other concerns or do you believe the necessary changes were made to hopefully prevent it from happening again? I have serious concerns, and this is why I wrote the book. Like I said, the book is about Iceland, but it's not about Iceland at all. Mm -hmm. And I think you hopefully you felt a bit uneasy when you yeah. got to the end. Uh, it's not a Hollywood ending. I mean, our teams get dismantled and m most of the cr cases never get investigated. And even the ones that do end, uh, end with very little sanction on the, p on the parties. Um, I think from everything I've seen in other countries, in my other work, I'm very worried that this is a, this is a, an, end an endemic problem. Maybe, I mean, Iceland was a super concentrated and easy to see example of, of how financial corruption could look. But I fear that something similar is, is in the air in many, many of the world's financial capitals. And I think when you, when you have rotten markets, you have rotten outcomes eventually. It, 
they mm. come they come home to roost because people make you know markets can do great work you know when we look at the price and we can see price moving and that that's an information signal that we can use uh, as market participants to make decisions you know should i build a factory or should i save the money or should i pay, pay bonuses and uh, whatever um but when those signals are corrupted you know when the share prices of banks can be misset for 10 years the whole society's uh, 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 resources are misallocated. Uh, and I fear that that's what we are looking at, uh, in the, especially in the West. And maybe, maybe even in China, maybe even with things like Evergrande, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I fear that uh, this is a much bigger problem than just poor Iceland. Yeah, and you could link that to you know, low, low interest rates, easy money. At the moment, you know, you look at the debts of not just the government, the private debt as well. It's just it's, crazy to think. So you can, yeah, yeah, it's higher than it's ever been. The debt, uh, global debt to GDP. Um, and so I think we're in a worse place than we were in 06, 07. And I think maybe the whole world is in Iceland right now, which is quite scary. Yeah, it is. And I guess you could say there's so many companies that are similar. They're almost zombie companies. You know, they can't survive without this capital coming through in the future. And if they can't raise more, you know, sell more bonds or raise more money, then they're bankrupt. Very and we've seen point. that with so much more happening at the moment. That's a very good point. Yeah. Very right, good. perfect. So, Jared, thank you so much for joining the Finance Podcast and to talk with me today. Uh, just, just on to my last question. What is one message you'd like listeners to take away from the book? I'd like uh, listeners to take away a, a healthy skepticism about markets and uh, a desire to, if you're if you're a market participant, or if you're in this if you're in this world, a desire to do what you can to make your part of that world a little better. I think that's a great message. Maybe don't always follow the trends. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thanks so much, Anthony. Thank you so much. So, if anyone wanted to buy the book, where were the best places? Like, Amazon and I, Harriman's the publisher as well. Yep, uh, in the UK, at Amazon and a b bunch of. Uh, you, I think every major UK Waterstones has it as well. Icelandssecret.com is the website. And on there, there's an order page. You can see internationally all the best places to, to get it. Perfect. I'll put it in the description below. So great. All right. Thanks again. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe and click the bell icon so you are notified when new podcasts are released. I hope you're leaving with some great value about investing, trading, and finance. See you on the next show.